Greetings, everyone. This is Terry Naturally with another edition of Terry Talks Nutrition. We're here every Saturday and Sunday morning from 8 o'clock until 9 o'clock Central Standard Time. And we are here for you. We want to provide as much information as possible to make it easier for you to make better, healthier, and quality of choices. Why? Because everything we do, everything we have, everything that we want to improve, everything we do is a choice. And our health is a choice as well. Maybe this might be new to you because sometimes you don't know why you get sick, why some people get cancer and others don't. And some people live a better quality of life And sometimes it just doesn't seem fair. Sometimes we believe, well, maybe we're being punished. Maybe we aren't living on the right side of the tracks. Maybe it's just the roll of the dice. It's just me. But why me? Because of your choices. We can choose to eat better, healthier, We can live a better quality of life. We can choose a better quality of exercise or at least some exercise and we we can get a better night's sleep. We can reduce excessively over-consuming alcohol. Our choice to smoke or not to smoke. All those choices are, are under our control No physician, no professional can help you as much as you, you can help yourself. So you have the responsibility. And I include myself. I'm not just pointing my finger at you. We all have to make the right choices. Now, maybe we didn't come into this world with all the characteristics and benefits of others. Maybe we didn't have the best birth. Maybe our mothers did not make the best choice. There's a reason why we are not all exactly the same. Some are better off than others. Some came from a very poor family, a low-income family, who could not afford the best food. But we can do better wherever we are. And whoever we are, and whatever age we are, doesn't matter. What matters is what we do now to make better choices to improve our health. And we can improve our health much easier, easier, I should say, than destroying our health. It takes decades to destroy our health. And if we change our lifestyle, and remember, 98% of all diseases is caused by our lifestyle choices. Food is a chemistry that changes our genes from good to bad or bad to good. So food is very, very powerful, containing nutrients, accessory food factors, all kinds of things such as proanthocyanidins, polyphenols, vitamins and minerals, all of these nutrients that we require to maintain a healthy body and chemistry and metabolic function. So I'm here just to share with you what I discovered by doing research. Some of the information I share with you so you know that by making choices, better choices, you can have better health. Absolutely. No question about it. I see it over and over and over again because I'm in contact with a lot of people that ask me questions that meet me on the streets when I'm doing a lecture someplace. And they're talking about how they have changed their life. 
from dead to healthy. They recovered, not exactly dead, dead, but feeling like they were dead. And now they're healthy again, doing things they never thought possible. And you can do the same. We're not going to all equally gain in our health benefits. But we will all gain to some degree in our health benefits. And it's more worthy to receive those benefits than not. So today we have a really good lineup of information to share with you. How to stop cancer. That's a pretty bold statement. I'm going to tell you how to stop cancer. Do you think it's possible? They're spending billions and millions and trillions of dollars looking for a cure for cancer. You are the cure for cancer. There will never be a pill or any kind of medical intervention that will cure cancer. Cancer is caused by our choices, by what we do and what we don't do that will preserve our health. We're also going to talk about the aging effects of sodium. Not necessarily salt, but sodium. And we have very sad news on childhood obesity. And you know, we talk about men always about boosting the libido. Men have a greater sex drive, I believe, than women. Men are turned on much easier than women. This is my observation. Not that I have any proof. And you have a lot of women out there that will say that I am off the beam. So we're going to talk about how to boost the libido for women. And then, you know, if you've listened to me in the past, you know that I have a great respect for olive oil as a healer and a prevention of diseases. And I've said before, Mary Fling, Mary I should say Dr. Mary Flynn, associate professor at Boston University. After 30 years of research on olive oil, she spent her lifetime, her career on olive oil. And she said it is the only food that she can say that will cure, prevent all of our chronic diseases. So if you're not including olive oil on a daily, daily basis, and not just sprinkling it on your salad, but actually consuming it by the tablespoons or the shot glass full. A shot glass contains two tablespoons of olive oil. The, the real, the half, the health addicts, of olive oil and know the benefits of olive oil, consume no less than four tablespoons per day. Not on food, not with cooking, but off the spoon or out of the shot glass. And in some of the Mediterranean countries, they consume a lot more than four tablespoons a day. And we're going to talk about the therapeutic value or values of olive oil that is based on summary of research findings. And then how to stop gout. And how to stop running out of energy from the benefits of exercise. And then why we should eat in the morning and not at night. So let's just jump right in here. And talk about our featured topic, stopping cancer.
Cancer is the uncontrollable replication of abnormal cells. A cancerous tumor is a solid mass of cancer cells growing together. Some forms of cancer don't produce tumors. For example, blood cancers, such as leukemia, do not form tumors. When cancer cells that form in one organ spread to other organs or areas of the body, it's called metastasis. And some of the most common cancers are breast, prostate, colon, and lung cancer. What are some of the factors that you and I can control that causes cancer and increases the risk of cancer significantly? So while they're looking for a cure from can- a cure for cancer, what about all the things in our environment that cause cancer? And we're consuming those subjects or, or chemicals. We're consuming them, and yet we don't worry about whether or not they're going to cause cancer in our bodies. Recently on one of my shows, I talked about nitrates and nitrites that are used to cure meats, like sausages, hot dogs, Bacon. They cause cancer. So we can avoid cancer risk substantially. Now, obesity is like the new smoking. We know smoking causes many different kinds of cancer, not just lung cancer. And obesity is linked to increased risk of 13 different forms of cancer. And in America, about 50% of the population of adults are classified as obese. Not exactly 50%. In the black community, about 48% of black Americans are obese. About 44% of Hispanic are obese. And 42% of Caucasians, white Americans, are obese. Obesity causes more diseases and cancer than smoking. Can we control that? Absolutely. Why don't we? Now, beyond obesity, tobacco use, smoking, increases the risk of cancer. Exposure to pesticides, radiation, chemicals, and just eating a poor diet increases your risk of cancer. A sedentary lifestyle. Lazy. Vegging out on the couch, watching TV. Aging. Genetics. Infections from bacteria or viruses. H. pylori causes gastric cancer. Epstein-Barr virus causes nasal cancers and lymphoma. We can stop all these causes and we can try to eliminate some of these risk factors of cancer. Cancer is just something not unknown All of these risk factors cause cancer. 
and no two cancers are the same. There will never be a pill that will cure cancer. There will never be a vaccine that cures cancer. Because what we do on a daily basis causes cancer. Now, there's natural treatments for cancer. And there is conventional cancer treatments, such as surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy, are all used to fight cancer. Are they good to fight cancer? Well, they can be extremely toxic, more toxic than the cancer. And many people die from the cancer, excuse me, from the drug therapy than the cancer. They're very, very toxic. Chemotherapy. When they treat a cancer patient with chemotherapy, they bring that patient almost to a near death. But they have to pull back the chemotherapy, because the patient would die. And many times the patients die from the treatment rather than the disease. I don't, personally, I just don't know how we can make somebody well with a treatment that is so harsh that it almost brings a patient to near death's door. If we took a 100 healthy people and treated them with chemotherapy in time they would die it hurts normal cells as well as cancer cells and the effectiveness varies greatly and then they have found in research that many natural medicines can be as effective or more effective and without the side effects of conventional chemotherapy. And they can also be used along with conventional chemotherapy. Many doctors are opposed to letting a cancer patient being treated with chemotherapy to take a natural medicine along with their treatment. And 99.9%, the doctor doesn't know what's going to happen to the patient with conventional chemotherapy. And from all the research I have seen, that natural herbal medicines or natural molecules actually make a cancer patient stronger and resist the side effects of conventional chemotherapy and makes the chemotherapy more effective at a much less dosage with much less toxicity. And the natural medicines are very safe with virtually no side effects. They do not harm normal cells. They work effectively on their own and can boost the effectiveness of conventional treatments and reducing their side effects. Now, here's a brand new study. I just ran across it, just released just in, within the last few weeks. This is a new study from Dr. A.J. Goyle. He is a a PhD researcher at City of Hope Hospital in Los Angeles in the Cancer Therapy Center. And the research was looking at the effectiveness of andrographis. Now, you've heard me talk about andrographis. Andographis is an Indian herb, grows in the Himalayas, grows throughout India, 
in, in Malaysia, and it's one of the most common, commonly used herbal medicines for all kinds of things. It protects the liver from damage. It protects the brain from damage. It's, it's one of the best cold and flu fighters you can ever find. In two days, 50% of the cold and flu symptoms are gone. It protects the liver from damage from chemotherapy. Also for the brain. There have been studies that show that under conventional chemotherapy, many brain cells and liver cells are destroyed. But if they're on the same chemotherapy with andrographis, there are much less damage, there is much less damage to the liver and to the brain. Now, looking at the effectiveness of andrographis against pancreatic cancer, which is a very difficult cancer to treat. Sometimes patients only last three months. They are newly discovered, and within three months, they have passed away. And especially pancreatic cancer cells that are immune-resistant, and, and andrographis it's a huge, has a huge boost to immune function and also to prevent the damage by standard drug treatments. And what Dr. Ajay Goyal did, he exposed cancer cells to andrographis, the cancer drug, and then the combination of the two. So he treated animals with cancer. and treated them with andrographis. And one group was treated with a cancer drug. And then another third group was treated both with a combination of the cancer drug and andrographis. Now the results of these studies, three studies, with andrographis alone, with the drug alone, and then the third study was the drug and andrographis together. Andrographis was extremely effective at suppressing tumor cells on its own and reduced tumor growth and reduced tumor sizes by up to 60%, 60%. But the combination of the two, andrographis and the drug. Reduce tumor cell formation by 90%. Now I know many doctors would instruct their patients to avoid natural medicines. Well, if I were diagnosed with cancer and my doctor told me well, first of all, I probably would not be in the doctor's office. But let's say, for the sake of this story, that I was. And the doctor told me not to use anything other than the chemotherapy. Why would I not want to use andrographis? Why would I not want to use other natural alternatives that have been proven safe, effective, and more resistant, more able to, re to overcome resistant cancer cells. This is very exciting news, as pancreatic cancer is very difficult to treat with a very poor prognosis. Now here's another study on andrographis and colon cancer. Dr. Goyle treated colon cancer cells including chemotherapy-resistant colon cancer cells with the herb andrographis and an extract from grape seed extract known as oligomeric proanthocyanidins, otherwise known as OPC. He did this with a combination of the chemotherapy together and also separately. He also treated colon cancer cells in an animal model 
with both natural medicines alone and combined. So he had three different studies again, three different study groups. One group was treated with andrographis. One group was treated with just the old PCs from grapeseed extract. And then the other group was the drug and the two herbs. And the result of these three different studies, while each was effective on its own, just what the grapeseed extract and the andrographis was effective on, on their own, individually. But by combining andrographis and OPCs from grapeseed extract was even better. In the cell study, the combination reduced cell proliferation, which means an increase in the number of cancer cells, by over 90%. 90%. In the animal model, the combination reduced tumor volume in 21 days, 21 days, three weeks, by 90%. What have you got to lose? You're fighting for your life. I would pull out all the weapons I could possibly shoot at the cancer cells. And andrographis and OPC have remarkable benefits to reduce cancer, growth, metastasis, replication, and proliferation. Now, I've got to take a break. Don't go anyway. I have a lot more coming up on cancer because we can fight back. It's not just the drug companies, it's not just the doctors, but you and I can fight back. I'll come back right after these messages right here. Don't go away. I'm Terry Naturally, and this is Terry Talks Nutrition. And welcome back, my friends. This is Terry Naturally, and this is your edition of Terry Talks Nutrition. Remember to go back to our website, terrytalksnutrition.com. You'll receive a lot more information, podcasts, YouTubes, radio shows, newsletters, scientific information, a lot more for you to gain as to how you can gain a better quality of life. And we're talking about cancer, how to stop cancer. Well, if you missed the first half of this program, I, I encourage you to go back and listen to this program from the very beginning. Now, when this show is done, I pre-record this program because I want it to be up where you can go to my website and pull it up and be able to go over it and over it and over it again. You may have missed some things. You may know somebody who has cancer. You may want to have them listen to it. So that's why we archive the radio show and all the newsletters so that you can offer these to your friends, relatives, family members, whoever. We all have a battle, but we all have a support team and health, nutrition, food, and supplements not only drugs. Drugs don't cure anything. And we have more cancer today than ever before. We have more diseases than ever before. We have more sick people than ever before. Obesity is running rampant. It's a pandemic of obesity, which is the new smoking we're killing ourselves, my friends, and we don't believe it. So now it's time to go back into our subject of cancer. Now here are the five big answers to cancer. Five big answers to cancer. Five of the most studied 
the best studied, the most potent natural anti-cancer medicines today. And Dr. Ajay Goyal, who is the research scientist at the Cancer Center Center at City of Hope Hospital in Los Angeles, outside of Los Angeles, it's in Monrovia, Pasadena area. He wrote a book on how to stop cancer. After all of his research, 20, over 20 years of research on natural medicines, he was hired by the hospital to continue his research on natural medicines because it holds holds a tremendous benefit for all diseases, especially cancer. And many doctors now are talking to him about adding these natural medicines to conventional therapy. So I'll go over some of these natural medicines. I just talked about andrographis. And there have been four or five or six really good, high quality. And you know, if these quality, if these studies were not quality, and when they're published, they could not be published in top journals. You'd only be able to get them published in very fly-by-night journals. But Dr. Ajay Goyal is able to get these studies on these compounds, natural medicines, in top of the top-rated cancer journals. Now I'm going to talk about andrographis, grapeseed extract, curcumin, berberine, and melatonin. All, all of these five in 25 or 30 studies have all been found safe with no significant side effects and have been used successfully against a variety of different cancers, including breast, prostate, colon, lung, and skin cancers. I would highly recommend. Of course, there's no reason why you can't talk to your doctor about this. Or if you feel like you want wanted to go on these natural medicines, one or two or three or four, you can tell your doctor you're doing that. I think it's good to let your doctor know what your intentions are and what you're doing And maybe this might open up the eyes of your doctor, your physician, as to how you are recovering. Seen some very remarkable results. You know, Dr. Goyle cannot treat cancer patients. And he can't even use cancer patients in his studies. Because the therapy for cancer patients is chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. You cannot go outside of that perimeter of treatments. But doctors can suggest, if you'd like, also add andrographis or add OPCs or melatonin. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of studies on these compounds for the treatment of cancer or to be used alongside conventional treatment of cancer. There is a great amount of help and hope for these natural medicines. And I know that Dr. Has, Dr. Ajay Goyal has, and in fact, I visited his research laboratory in Los Angeles. There's about 40 top researchers in his laboratory from all over the world that have come to his center because they want to find new solutions because they know that conventional therapy is not the answer. 
and many of his oncologists who do treat cancer now are suggesting that they add one or two or three of these with their conventional cancer treatments. Time will change. You will see it won't be long. And doctors will start using some of these natural medicines. Now, what about some new hope on childhood obesity? Here's a story. We all love stories. Here's some more news on obesity in kids. The percentage of children with obesity, a choice, more choice for mom and dad, but it's a choice. And it has tripled since 1970. Recently, the official BMI charts were revised because so many children have moved past obesity. This is, hey, we're talking about kids, kids who moved past obesity to become severely obese. Let that sink in. Wonder why we are sick? Well, drug companies are, their stock is climbing like crazy. I would never invest my money in any drug company in the world. I don't care how much money they make. And in January, the American Academy of Pediatrics changed their official guidelines. They now recommend weight loss drugs, weight loss drugs for kids as young as 12. It's all money. We eat a bunch of crap which causes us to get sick and cause cancer. And then drug companies suck up the money by changing the recommendations as how treatments should be conducted. Now they're recommending weight loss drugs for kids as young as 12 and weight loss surgery for those 13 and older. What have we become? Last December, the FDA approved a new injectable drug treatment for obesity, which can be given to children 12 and up. How sickening, how sad that we don't teach kids how to eat And as adults, we don't eat right either. So it's hard to teach kids how to eat if we aren't disciplined enough to eat correctly either. So we're not, we're we're neglecting our children. They're malnourished. They're obese. And there's no reason for it. What about the aging effects of sodium? Sodium ages you faster. In a research study, the researchers collected data from over 11,000 adults starting in their 50s and following them for a minimum of 30 years to look at the effect of sodium levels on health over the long term. The results of these studies, people with higher sodium levels were up to 50% more likely to show signs of advanced aging with higher levels of inflammation, reduced lung and heart function, 
Those with high sodium levels were also 64% more likely to develop a chronic disease such as heart failure, diabetes, or dementia. So get your sodium levels down. Less than 5% of dietary sodium in the average diet actually comes from salt. Does that make sense? Less than 5% of our dietary sodium intake in the average diet of adults comes from salt added at the table. So, use your salt. Because the vast majority of sodium in the American diet, guess what? Comes from manufactured, ultra-processed foods because they use it as a preservative. Years ago, salt was always used to preserve foods. Ultra-processed, ultra-refined processed foods contain the highest level of sodium in the American diet. Sliced deli meats, hot dogs, packaged breakfast cereal, canned soup, and vegetables. Frozen prepared foods such as pizza. How do we avoid it? Easy. Replace prepared prepared foods with fresh meats, fresh fruits and vegetables, and get your sodium levels down. You automatically will not be including any sodium. I talked about libido at the beginning of the program. So here is a libido boost for women. One of the best herbal products for women's sexual health. 80 women between the ages of 18 and 50 with low sexual desire were treated with ashwagandha or placebo for eight weeks. And the result of this study, the women treated with ashwagandha, it's an Indian herb. If it's not familiar to you, in India, they do not grow ginseng. There's no ginseng in the Ayurvedic herbal medicine. Ashwagandha performs very similarly to ginseng, though ashwagandha is known as Indian ginseng. Not factually, not truly, but it's, a, it's kind of given that name because it has the same effects as ginseng. So ashwagandha is very, very effective for a variety of conditions. It's one of my favorites. Especially if you get a very high quality, highly standardized ashwagandha that is standardized at like about 35% because all of the past history on ashwagandha was that they were treated with milk so there's dairy associated with extraction of ashwagandha That's the old traditional method of extraction going back thousands and thousands of years. But now a new method has been developed to extract ashwagandha with alcohol and water for a much, much better and higher level of standardization of the withlinolides that are associated with ashwagandha. 35% 35% extract versus 3 to 5% of those extracted with milk. 
Now, the women treated with this form of ashwagandha saw nearly double the improvement in sexual health as measured by a standardized score for sexual function. The improvement was noted every factor measured, including sexual desire, arousal, and satisfaction. This study confirms a previous study in which otherwise healthy women experiencing sexual dysfunction and reduced libido were treated with ashwagandha, which increased overall sexual health by almost 20%, and arousal specifically by 30%. So you do want to take about, of the 35% extraction of ashwagandha, about 150 milligram dosage, two or three times daily. And you can tailor this as you like. You know, nothing works perfectly in everybody. We all tolerate different, different foods, different beverages. You know, take the example of beer or wine. Some people, one or two glasses, and they have a buzz on. They're giddy, they're happy, uh, they're kind of slurring their words. Some people can drink a bottle and half of wine, and you can't even tell they've had a drop. We are all unique and different. So when you're trying a natural substance that has no side effects, experiment. Try one or two a day and let yourself have 30, 60 days. See how you feel. Do you feel any greater sexual arousal? Do you feel a greater libido? Do you feel more satisfaction? If not, Increased by another 150 milligrams. Play around with it a little bit. Experiment with it a little bit. You know, even, even conventional medicine is not an art. Or I should say it's not a science. It's more of an art. Because no diabetic gets exactly the same level of insulin. Everybody is different. So experiment. Now, there are other libido boosters for women. There is maca, M-A-C-A, maca. In, in menopausal women, six, week of, six weeks of maca reduce sexual dysfunction as measured by a standardized assessment score by almost 30%. Rhodiola, Relieves fatigue, improves mood, and binds to estrogen receptors without activating estrogen. Red ginseng, as I mentioned, ashwagandha, is, no, is known as the Indian ginseng, and red ginseng is the best class of ginseng of that species. It increases energy and libido. Increased sexual arousal by 13% versus the placebo in menopausal women. Increased energy by 20%. Reduction in fatigue for postmenopausal women taking red ginseng. What I would suggest to do, I would take about 300 milligrams of red ginseng with maca and rhodiola, and ashwagandha, and zinc, and take it daily, one or two, three times a day, depending on what your needs are. Now, one of my favorite subjects, olive oil. I'll probably wrap up the program right after this subject. We're getting near to closing out the hour. But therapeutic value of olive oil. Here's a summary of some of the research that is quite amazing. 
Researchers collected and summarized findings from published research studies on olive oil, which included the following results. Now, I said earlier that the average Mediterranean population consumes about four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil every day and more. Four tablespoons is about a quarter of a cup of olive oil. Some Mediterranean people consume up to a cup, yes, a cup of olive oil daily. Now, daily intake of four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil reduce the risk of all cardiovascular disease by 31%. For each three quarters of a teaspoon, which is only 10 grams, increased daily extra virgin olive oil intake, reduce heart disease by 10%. And a half teaspoon of olive oil daily Reduce the risk, <clears throat> excuse me, reduce the risk of dying from heart disease by 19% versus people who never consumed olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil intake can reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes by 40%. And people ingesting one half teaspoon of olive oil daily have a 29% reduced risk of neurological degenerative diseases like dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, like Parkinson's disease, MS. Regular consumption of extra virgin olive oil reduce the risk of any type of malignant cancer, any type of cancer. Let me say that again. Any type of cancer by 31% and reduce the risk of pancreatic and urinary cancer by 54%. This is a food like nothing other, other food. And I think Dr. Mary Flynn was right. I mentioned her early in the program, social professor at Boston University. She said there is no food more beneficial for preventing and curing diseases than olive oil. And olive oil has been used for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Some of the trees are thousands of years old. I saw one tree when I was traveling through Egypt and Jordan that was a thousand years old. Magnificent. And they're still producing olives. And some of the people I have met in the Mediterranean country, a gentleman that had stomach cancer, the doctor prescribed one cup of olive oil daily on an empty stomach. Now, this man today, he's 90, in the mid-90s, 94, 95, and he's still working out in their family orchard of 700 trees. And he's 94, 95, recovered from cancer of the stomach. And they all believe, including the doctor, the doctor was one who prescribed the olive oil, that it was due to the olive oil. So these are some very powerful statistics why you want to include olive oil at least one or two tablespoons a day. If you want to make it really, really powerful, four tablespoons a day. It'll do you a world of good. Well, that's it, my friends. That's the end of our program for today. I'll be back here again tomorrow, Sunday, 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock Central Standard Time. So join me again. Uh, but for right now, uh, do something constructive. Add olive oil to your diet. It's the best thing you can possibly do if you did nothing else. But don't do that. Do everything else you can. But add olive oil first. Get more exercise. Sleep better. Change your diet. Reduce the carbohydrates and the sugar. And my friends, say a prayer for this crazy, crazy, insane world. God bless you, and God bless this great country. Thank you for listening to Terry Talks Nutrition Weekly Show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform, including Apple, Google, and iHeartRadio.